Hello everybody, welcome to Microeconomics. I'm Professor Baez and we're going to get started with Chapter 1, Economic Principles. Within this chapter, we're going to learn what economics is about and essentially the general science of economic theory and start the foundation of the class. Economics is essentially a science that studies the allocation, consumption, and distribution of scarce resources in our society. It, 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 it consists of an analysis of society at large in terms of the local scale, macro scale, and sometimes at the international scale. It analyzes the notion that often cases people have unlimited wants but have limited resources to satisfy those wants. Those resources could be financial resources or economic resources. The difference between financial resources and economic resources are essentially the financial means to achieve uh, some form of consumption like cash, debit, uh, debit cards, some bank accounts, or any financial instruments. Economic resources are more towards the physical resources available to create or obtain something, land, labor, capital, and planning equipment. And in economics, we also study market activity at the local level or at the macro level. We analyze household and firm economic decision making uh, the nation's economic conditions, as well as business fluctuations and international markets. And the economy has significant sectors. It goes through a lot of different fluctuations over time. We need to be able to analyze it at the local level, at the individual level, at the regional level, and at the national level as well. So economics is a very important uh, subject that most of us are introduced and most of us are members of society, which is part of an economy. And we make important economic decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that can benefit uh, or can significantly change the trajectory of, of you in society or as part of an economy. As we analyze the US economy during the most recent historical crisis of our modern time, the COVID-19 crisis, which started in the um, uh, fall 2019, we can see that it had significant downturns to the US economy. The most recent downturn happened in 2009 during the financial meltdown and the real estate uh, crisis that led to a negative 4% drop in the U.S. economy for about 18 months. After that, we experienced a period of economic expansions. The green uh, bars here indicate economic expansions with a few crises or some slight recessions in between uh, 2011 and 2014. But for the last 10 years, we had a significant economic expansion until fall 2019 when we had the COVID-19 outbreak and still ongoing. Uh, and a downturn of a significant magnitude can last between 6 months, 8 months, 12 months, 16 months, 18 months, or 24 months. We're going into potentially 12 months of downturn economic activity, which you see here that the uh, downturn in the economy was significantly lower the first quarter of 2020 uh, and for the entire year than it for, for all of that quarter than it did for the entire 2008-2009 crisis. This crisis is quite significant as most of us know than any other one we have experienced in the last uh, 30 uh, uh, years or so, in the last 100 years since the last uh, significant uh, pandemic in the 1920s. Now, when we're looking at the difference between economics, we have two schools of uh, two significant uh, economic concepts: microeconomics and macroeconomics. Analyzing things at the micro level, or analyzing things at the macro uh, level. Microeconomics deals with local individual activity, uh, and macroeconomics deals with broader scale of society. So when we look at microeconomics, it studies individual decision making, for example, our decision making of a day-to-day -day basis, any individual person making decisions to increase their economic uh, well-being, or any individual household, local business, or local economic activity in your local community, in your local city, in your uh, region, or at the state level, for example. Uh, it analyzes local business, local markets, consumer behavior, consumers buying goods and services. Uh, essentially, we can analyze market activity, whether markets are com uh, preferably competitive, uh, monopoly structure dominated by one firm, or oligopoly, where there's less competition. And it emphasizes in mainly on individual decision making and optimizing those decisions. Macroeconomics is a little bit more broader. 
It analyzes the aggregate behavior of all economic activity, or essentially of broader sectors of the economy. It focuses on things like uh, the general level of unemployment, the inflation rate in terms of stability of prices or our prices increasing over time, uh, economic growth and economic prosperity, uh, economic stability. It, uh, it analyzes the effects of recessions uh, and its long-term effects uh, that it may have into society, and also the economic expansions and, and constraints. Now, both of them are complementary of one another, micro and macro. Uh, one focuses specifically on local individuals, per se, local individual decision making, and the other one focuses at the overall big picture, macroeconomic activity at the macro scale. And throughout history, we had different schools of thoughts that view the economy differently. Uh, for simplicity, it can be micro, macro, but there's always different ways of looking at the economy. We can have different individuals look at economic activity or have different views of the economy. So we have what is called the classical school of thought of economics, and we have the Keynesian school of thought of economics, two different views of an economy. Uh, and there's, of course, different other economic schools of thoughts, but we're going to focus on the classicals and the Keynesian school of thoughts for this particular example. The classical school of economics has a more free market activity perspective. The market is free, let the market function, no regulation, let the market uh, make transactions that are mutually beneficial for uh, the market and active members and the business activity. So essentially it's promoting free market activity, laissez-faire capitalist system. Um, the market knows best. Limited government intervention, no government intervention, lower the uh, regulations, take them away. The government should only focus on providing safety and security for the public and nothing more. Uh, with well, the classicals are you that the economy can recognize any crisis, uh, any downturn, any contraction or recessions and self-regulate and heal itself within some time. The question is how long it would take is always a matter of discussion. So when you're looking at classical perspectives is a little bit more towards let the market function with its own within its own course. Do not intervene in the economy's affair. Um, the market knows best and it can heal from any crisis. So it's more of a hands-off approach. A lot of people still have this perspective of the classical, the classical view of the economy. Let the market determine its own course. It was heavily tested during the Great Depression. Most people had the view of a self-regulating economy and a free market approach. The market knows best if there's a crisis, the economy can recover. And a lot of people questioning, which became to be known as John Maynard Keynes, a great economist that eventually introduce uh, Keynesian economics uh, during the uh, Great Depression uh, and post the Great Depression. Keynesian uh, economics argues that the market can fail and markets often fail and if they fail they require some form of uh, government policy and government intervention and any depressed economy requires direct government intervention through economic and public policy to stimulate the economy during some crisis or else it could take a long time for the economy to recover and if it takes a long time it may not be uh, fast enough to recover uh, a local economy that is in significant or local or the general economy that is suffering from a significant crisis so we need more of an active government role when it comes to Keynesian economics John Maynard Keynes uh, specified that when we have a crisis we cannot wait for the economy to recover we need to do something today to improve the conditions of the market. So a lot of the things that were done during the COVID-19 crisis were basically Keynesian, direct government intervention. The COVID relief checks, the business checks, government policy, uh, directly injecting monetary stimulus into the market was Keynesian approach. However, how quickly they do it is always for debate and it can take a long time based on uh, public policy and elected officials. Uh, two different views of the economy. Leave it alone, hands-off approach, or Keynesian economy. Sometimes we need to intervene, and it requires fast intervention. Now, Adam Smith introduced one of the first written pieces of economic writing, The Wealth of Nations. He's one of the first known economists of, our, uh, of, of, uh, of economic theory, uh, theory. And in his book, The Wealth of Nations, he introduced several concepts. And one of them was uh, the invisible hand. And this, for a long time, it revolutionized, and actually 
uh, was uh, guided businesses to create economic activity. So basically, the invisible hand specifies that the economy is guided by some invisible forces that can generate economic efficiency, economic well-being, and promote development. He specified that the invisible hand is crucial for an individual to create a product. Uh, this person may be driven by self-interest uh, by and becoming an entrepreneur. And he's guided by this invisible forces to create a product that can be beneficial for the consumer, for society. And in this process, the person is pursuing his uh, or her or its own benefit uh, by, in this case, generating some form of profit. But in the process, what it does, it creates employment, it creates a product, it may develop the infrastructure or the channels, uh, discover resources, and so on. And eventually, it may benefit most, most people, not everyone, but most people. And what it does is uh, when we wake up in the morning, we're guided by this invisible factor to get things done. And most individuals are guided by an invisible hand. In this case, was introduced in the wealth of nations, and it specified that we need to have some soul of some role of uh, self-interest in order to do something. And uh, he focused mainly on the, and the entrepreneurs and the ability of entrepreneurs to create economic prosperity, employment, and infrastructure development, and some form of product that could be needed for society. We're talking about the 19th, 20th century in this case. Uh, and of course, today is a lot different world than what it was then before. But he pointed out important concepts like a specialization, the division of labor, uh, specialized skills, and the production process of goods. And, and uh, most people will say that Adam Smith is actually uh, one of the early classicals um, in this case, when it comes to uh, one of the early fathers of economic theory and one of the first original pieces of economic thought in the wealth of nations. A lot of things have changed since then, uh, and different economic structures have arise. And one of those different, uh, one, some of those economic structures consists of command economic systems that still exist today in the world. If you can think of some economic structures that are under a command regime, we have, for example, um, North Korea uh, that commands its economy. It's a central authority determine economic activity for all of its members. The government determines everything um, from what gets produced, how it gets produced, what's the wage rate, uh, what's in the media, and so on. It's command structure. Uh, we had several cases and several examples of a command system, an authoritarian command structure. Uh, Venezuela, for example, uh, is an extreme example of a command socialist uh, going to the extreme. Uh, and at, at the same case, we have what is called the market economic system, which is the opposite. Let the market flow and let individuals interact in mutual transactions for mutual benefits. The market can steer the economy to economic transactions that could be beneficial. And most economies strive to be a market-driven oriented economy uh, since uh, a lot of the transactions that occur are in some cases for mutual benefits. But what we learn with Adam Smith is that often cases that self-interest can go a little bit too far. And so it's possible that someone may have a higher um, uh, interest than the other person and be driven more and make decisions that can only benefit him or her at the expense of someone else. So we need to be careful in the market economy, but for the most part, the market economy could generate economic structures that are promising. What we really have in today's world is a mixed market economic structure. And what a mixed market economic structure is, is that we have a central government that formulates economic policy, public policy, and has elected officials. It's a central government here controlling economic activity and society at the local level, at the city level, state level, and federal level. And then we have the free market. For the most part, in a mixed market structure, we have a government that is responsible to um, apply and, and, and control economic activity or public policy and implement laws and so on and, uh, and apply those laws. But we have a free market approach where you are free to engage in economic decisions that are beneficial to you as a person and business activity for the most part, it's for the most part relatively free, but it does have a central government. Uh, most countries worldwide today are a mixed market structure, uh, especially uh, we can see the role of government and what happened in Capitol Hill 
um, earlier this year with the elections, uh, where people may become unsatisfied with the role of government. That's always a big question. How big should the role of government be in society when you have a mixed market, when you have government and society? Some people argue with no government. Some people argue that more government. Some people want to take off the institutions completely. The truth is that we need a balance of both. And it's, it's more of a responsible with well-established leaders that determine how successful a, mi a mixed economy system is uh, and so on. Now, there's basic principles of economic decision making. And this is where we start making decisions as individuals. Most of us as individuals have to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis in anything that we do. The decision to go to college, the decision to major in the degree that you're majoring in, or the decision for you individually depends on your uh, surroundings, your availability of choices, and so on. All individuals make decisions every day, regardless of who we are. And all individuals are free to decide on what to do and what not to do and how to engage them. That's a, a, a basic principle that is embedded with us. And often cases we're able to make good decisions. In some cases we make decisions that are a little bit less than optimal. But we live in a free market society where we can make decisions that could benefit us. Or sometimes not so much. And principle number one specifies that the choices that we make are necessary because resources are relatively scarce. And we spoke about resources being financial resources, economic resources, uh, capital resources, and so on. Financial resources allow you to make decisions for financial transactions. Buying goods and services is determined by how much financial means you have, and so on. Economic resources allow you to uh, engage in an activity. Your physical ability is a human resource. If we have capital, plant, and equipment, we can make decisions on how to best allocate those resources to generate some potential outcome. Everyone makes decisions based on their available uh, resources or based on certain situations. And let's take a look at Cape Town, South Africa. Cape Town, South Africa uh, found itself in a significant water crisis uh, recently. And one of the most important resources that we have is water. It's a fundamental pillar of life, water. And without water, you know, we can't really function to take a shower, eat, cook, um, drink, stay hydrated, and so on. So they have to make decisions at the individual level, at the resource level, water is a natural resource, and at the infrastructure level, limiting or rationing their citizens, public officials, how much water they can consume per day. And a lot of the times you will find that, that they were limited to one gallon per household. Um, and other resources that are essential, like in this case, minerals, uh, raw materials, uh, capitals, and so on. And then, of course, most of us are familiar with the financial resource, which is uh, financial uh, fiat currency and so on, or debit cards and, and credit cards to make financial transactions. Resources are a little bit different. Now, keep, uh, when we uh, keep looking at the basic principles of individual choice, we go on to principle number two that anytime we make a decision, we face an opportunity cost. The opportunity cost is giving up something in order to obtain a final outcome or the next best alternative to a decision making. An opportunity cost can be looked at as a form of a trade-off. What are we uh, giving up when we obtain something? What are you giving up to obtain something in return? For example, if you're in college enrolled right now, you're probably taking three or four or five different classes and at the same time working or spending time with family uh, and so on. What are you giving up for this academic semester to be enrolled at Cal Poly full time even though we are live online? What, did you, what are you giving up, partially giving up or fully giving up? It could be working full time. It could be... Uh, doing something uh, with family, or it could be some form of leisure. You give up an X amount of goods or an X amount of time in order to engage in an activity all of the time, spending time with friends or spending time with family. It's a trade-off. What do you give up in order to get something else in return? That opportunity cost exists in most decisions that uh, people engage in society. An opportunity cost could be a production trade-off, a decision trade-off, or 
anything that the person or the individual gives up when making any economic decisions. They're pressing all of the time. Next thing you go out with friends, think about what am I giving up if I don't go out with friends? Um, or if I go out with friends. If you go out with friends, well, you probably give up time with family, working, reading, leisure, or something else that you could have done. Um, our principle number three specifies that once we, once we decide um, that we have resources that are limited, that we face trade-offs, the question comes as to how much of an activity should we do? Uh, making marginal decisions, marginalizing our decision makings. Uh, how much of an activity should we do based on our available resources, our given trade-offs, and the outcome? Uh, how much time should you spend studying? What's the trade-off? Well, you, spend, you might study for a class and it requires time. What are you giving up time because you need to study? Um, and how much of how much time you need to study depends on the uh, um, amount of content that you need to cover. Two hours, three hours, four hours, well, that's a trade-off that you have given up. Something else you could have done. Uh, go out, family, or work. Uh, and the most important thing is how much, for example, for college is how much time should you spend uh, at Cal Poly? Two years, three years, four years, five years. Most people spend five years. Uh, what is your trade-off? Well, you're not potentially giving up employment, something else you could have done. Uh, a lot of you may be working part-time or, or fully in, in enrolled at Cal Poly, and so on. It depends on how much of an activity you do really depends on the expected outcome and expected return um, that you may obtain from that activity. How much, how many uh, employees should we hire? Um, how much products do we need to produce a good or service? How much resources do we need in order to uh, uh, develop a good or service? How much water should we allocate to the citizens of Cape Town, South Africa per household and given our population? Those are important decisions that need to be made. And what we see in principle number four uh, is a natural uh, principle essentially that people tend to respond to incentives. Uh, people naturally respond to incentives. We are driven in a way that we tend to respond when something incentivizes us. Take a look when you were a child, for example, or if you have siblings that are uh, little or young. If you incentivize them, they can behave well or they can, you know, um, behave in a way that is intended to what you desire. Uh, they're crying or so, you let them know, hey, we're going to give you candy or you're going to get a toy. You're incentivizing the person to respond or change their behavior based on the expectation of an incentive or a reward uh, since we're little. Uh, and so on. And when we get older, people respond to incentives. And we need to be careful what those incentives are because it can trigger behavior changes or it can make someone behave differently. A lot of the times when people are incentivized financially, if you have a degree, you are financially rewarded with higher income. Uh, if you pursue a MBA or a master's degree, it may, that may be uh, because you have the incentive to have higher incomes or just by going to college, there's a there's the incentives to have a higher financial reward than those that do not, and so on. And we need to also analyze that our, cons our elected officials have a powerful role in incentivizing their constituents. And we can actually see when incentives could be used in the right way and when incentives are used in ways that can actually change someone's behavior. And that's important because people are highly responsive and highly sensitive to some uh, incentives or how people are, uh, how people respond and what's worded in the messages. And officials know this. If you incentivize uh, individuals, they will respond. And you know we have here different presidents and different elected officials that can incentivize their constituents in order to have an outcome that the person may want to achieve like getting elected to office or doing something, or the most recent case of the run on Capitol Hill. Uh, people tend to respond. And you can have a good response or a response that was not ideal, uh, and so on. So when we're looking at uh, principles further elaborating uh, the principal concepts, we tend to interact in the economy. And this interaction can lead to greater outcomes. Uh, our interaction depends on our social setting, our circle, and our, uh, our in geographic locations. Principle number five uh, specifies that in a market economy where people are mutually interacting in society, there's gains from trade. People can trade with each other mutually. 
and in a market economy, economic transactions can take place and benefit the individuals interacting in a market. And those gains from trades are realized to individuals at the local level uh, and also uh, cities, country states, and potentially in the international community that trades with other countries. And in this principle, we see that a specialization can occur uh, in the market and the resources could be used more efficiently and more productive and increase society's uh, output. So for example, in the class, we may have different individuals from different majors. Each individual student is specializing in different sets of expertise. And you go into the market and you trade those expertise uh, in the labor market or in your respective markets with someone else. And we have gains from those trades and everyone specialized. Um, we had uh, John, uh, John uh, in this case, uh, made, um, Adam Smith introduced the role of specialization in the production process. Specialized skill sets can generate higher output in any given factory, like for example, production lines. Uh, principle number six uh, lets us know that when a market is well established with adequate markets where people mutually interact uh, and make economic decisions and people are responsive to different mechanisms like constituents incentivizing, most markets tend to reach an equilibrium outcome if everything is well established. An example of this is the labor market. And the labor market can be in equilibrium or it can be in disequilibrium or it can be uh, chaotic sometimes. So most markets, when they are well established and people make decisions freely and respond to incentives, markets can lead to equilibrium outcomes. Equilibrium outcomes is when things are well off, when things are going well, when things are promising. Uh, when we had uh, when we have an economy that is moving in the right direction most people are doing well for example and we have different markets we have financial markets we have the imports and exports markets we have goods markets we have capital markets and we have the labor market where most of us participate and once you graduate college you go into a labor market or start your own business or be a contractor in the labor market and the labor market is considered an equilibrium when most people that have graduated, in this case in the college setting, enter the labor market and there's an employer willing and able to hire the individual for employment. Um, where we're quantity demanded of uh, laborers meets quantity supply of people seeking labor. However, it's important to note that equilibrium does not always mean 100% employment in the labor market, for example. There's always going to be some time, some friction, some structural changes that are going to take place before uh, we reach full equilibrium. So 99% of the class, for example, may be employed, but there may be that one person that could take some time. The market is considered in equilibrium if the majority, or in this case, if almost everyone has an employment that um, that they were looking for if they were if we all graduate at the same time and everyone's looking for employment because there could be some time for any given reasons or any given friction that that one person may not be able to find it right away but the market is considered to be employment um, in reality it's actually as, as long as there's within four percent to six percent uh, people still looking for for work and the other 94 95 percent are employed the market is considered to be in equilibrium in the labor market uh, right now you can actually say that the labor market is not in equilibrium. A lot of people are partially employed. A lot of people are laid off because of the crisis. A lot of people are not working, looking for work or business have shut down. The market is not in equilibrium. And even when the market is doing well, some people are looking for work and it's considered in equilibrium. Uh, principle number seven is a very important principle. It specifies that all of our resources should be used efficiently to achieve society's goals. All of the resources and sometimes that's that that's uh, difficult your financial resources should be used efficiently so that uh, most people don't end up in, in, in debt or in uh, significant financial burdens economic resources need to be used efficiently so that we don't deplete our resources or run out of resources or mismanage resources 
Uh, because essentially, society needs to continue going. The economy and people need to continue moving forward, uh, and so on. And what we see is that often cases, there is possibility that resources could be underutilized, underemployed, inefficiently used, uh, or not used appropriately. And we see that we have a, a, an issue with the efficient use of resources with equity or fair distribution of resources. Sometimes what is efficient is not always fair, and sometimes what's fair is, may not be that efficient. The efficient use of resources sometimes conflicts with equitable or fair outcomes. Um, and the example that we, that we talked earlier is the water crisis in Cape Town, South Africa. They were attempting to officially control the water supply so that it can last uh, enough time so that when the water situation recovered, society can go back to normal in Cape Town. But that was unfair because some people needed more than one gallon. And unfortunately, they couldn't do anything. It's a natural resource that in Cape Town, South Africa was depleted uh, for various reasons. You know, it can argue with uh, the change of the water supplies, global structure changes, and so on, the environment changes. But they needed to efficiently control the water in Cape Town, South Africa to meet the needs of society. But some people view it as unfair because others needed more than others, but everyone was given the same. So it's really hard to have efficiency and equity almost always the same. Uh, and that's, you can actually find examples today in society where that's an issue. Efficiency and equity, uh, fair outcomes. Um, what's efficient may not always be as fair or equitable, and what's fair is not always that efficient and so there's always this back and forth backlash between uh, fairness and equity and so on we can attempt to be as equitable as possible with the highest level of efficiency but as there always will be some form of conflict for example the water dam distribution water dams are built all over the world for the uh, you know it generates electricity power and so on it requires engineers infrastructure development so it's efficient it hires people uh, you create electricity you create power to power the cities and so on and it meets the needs of society but it has some form of environmental unfairness that some people may consider some people may care some people may not pay that much attention to but the marine line is distorted it's never the same once it's, it's distorted and it changes the ecosystems, the local communities in the area that may be displaced, and so on. Uh, and then we can go on and on and on with different life situations where uh, efficient or fair outcomes have always been in conflict with one another. But this is one of them. Uh, but we need you know, to power our cities. We need to have our water. We need to have water for showering, eat, cook, drink, and so on. But it may have conflict. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the example of... Uh, the drinking straw for drinks, you know, for us, we drink sufficient, we use the straw, but if you throw it away, it goes to the environment, it may end up in a uh, marine life uh, body. So we need to have a global perspective on things. Uh, it's important to always analyze things when we're looking at the economy with an economic analytical approach, factual information that can lead to good recommendations. When we're looking at the global economy, here we have the country of Canada. We can analyze the economy in a global perspective with GDP per capita, the GDP per person. It's the average income per person in a given country based on the US dollars. As of 2011, Canadians had a GDP per capita of about $50,000, really good quality of life. The US, um, one of the highly desirable countries in the view of most, has a GDP per capita uh, very close to that of Canadian neighbors, about 48,000 as of 2011, although it has increased significantly since. And the GDP per capita measures the financial ability and earnings of a person, or the average GDP per capita per person. It's a good way to measure country for country based on financial capabilities. Uh, and it also, uh, you know, it, it tells a lot of the income ability of a person in a different location. Japan, uh, the GDP per capita is about 45,000. Japan is very interesting since it had a rapid economic development since the 1940s after World War uh, II and is now one of the highest GDP per capita in the world uh, for various reasons. When we look at Mexico, there's a lot of issues and a lot of uh, things going on with Mexico. The GDP per capita 
surprisingly, it's $10,000 per person. That means that the average person in Mexico, on average, has the capability to make around $10,000. Uh, per person. That's three to four times less uh, than Japan, Canadian counterparts, uh, the US and European counterparts. And we can argue that purchasing parity differences and so on, the, the direct comparison here shows that a country that is just a neighbor uh, within three to four hour distance from us in Los Angeles has a lower GDP per capita than the US and Canada. And it shouldn't be the case. Uh, increasing the, a country's GDP per capita is important to increase the economic well-being of the citizens in that country, and it will resolve a lot of things. You can argue Mexico has had a lot of issues with lack of government transparency and economic development, along with a lot of instability. Uh, China. China is very important because it's going to become one of the most economically uh, advanced and powerful countries coming the end of this 20, 21, and 2030 uh, um, decade. It does have a GDP per capita of $5,000 and so on, a little bit higher now at 6000 But it has to do with, with the fact that they have about 1.5 billion citizens. And a lot of parts of China are well developed, and a lot of parts of China are still underdeveloped. So it's important to note those differences. If we look at Burundi, it has a GDP per capita per person of $200.75, um, $275 per person. That's not monthly, that's not weekly, that's per year. There are people in different parts of the world that make a living off less than a dollar a day. So we can argue with, uh, not argue, but we can uh, state that there's the all time say that sometimes the more money does not necessarily make uh, or contribute to more happiness, but it does facilitate a lot of different things uh, that it may not that, that may not facilitate in different parts of the world. So having a global perspective is important with factual information. Now, uh, going back to the economic principles, we have the markets and we have government activity all of the time. All of us participate in a market-driven economy, and most of us have the ability or the capability to also run for office and be part of government at the local city, state, and federal level, if you choose to. And principle number eight specifies that often cases when all trades are mutually beneficial in markets, um, the markets tend to move toward efficient outcomes, resolving any issues that are embedded within the market without government intervention. Principle number eight is rel relatively hopeful. It specifies that if there's any discrepancies, issues in society, the markets will resolve within their own capability. We as the public and members of society can come to an agreeable solution in resolving any issue that we may uh, deem important. And there's a lot of things that can come to mind to you today that you can think of issues that are happening in society uh, with BLM, with the rioting on Capitol Hill, with the division of the country, with different perspectives, with uh, a lot of things that are happening. Principle number eight specifies that individuals in markets or financial crisis or uh, you know, meltdowns in the financial sector, we can recognize them and come to an effective solution to resolve that issue. Um, but sometimes it could take a long time. So this is more towards the laissez-faire capital structure, the laissez-faire economics. Let the market resolve and the market knows best. We have the ability to come together and resolve them. It's possible, but it could take a long time. And principle number nine is more of a Keynesian approach that when markets don't achieve efficiency or resolve issues within their own capabilities, it is the responsibility of the government to intervene through public policy and economic policy to improve society's welfare. Or if there's an issue in society, the government has to steer society in a way that it can resolve them effectively bringing them uh, in, a, in a consensus to resolve them appropriately. I think it comes down to leadership, training, responsibility, and accountability when it comes to holding government accountable and holding government citizens accountable and holding the general public accountable on all sectors. Now, with the economy as a whole, we're looking at uh, principle number 10. Uh, we are in a highly driven market economy where all of us participate regardless of who we are. 
uh, and when we spend money in society, it stimulates a chain reaction. Uh, and this chain reaction is called a multiplier effect. When one person spends money, it creates multiple transactions. So you as a student, you buy your books, or you go out to eat, or you buy computers, or you go out with friends. And when you spend, you stimulate a multiple chain reactions. When you spend your income, it creates consumption. That consumption goes to the business as revenue, and that revenue is used to pay the wages, to pay for the supplies, and it's good for the economy that you're spending. Uh, when that person gets paid the wage, that person now has income to spend. And the chain goes on and on and on. It's a multiplier effect expansion process. So we make a living off selling and buying things and engaging in economic transactions. So this multiplier effect is important because if that multiplier uh, activity of one person's spending is another person's income continues, the economy continues prospering. Uh, and if it slows down, it has an inverse effect. It's, it, it, it declines. Basically, it lowers the economic transactions. So we need to be careful with uh, the economy improving or slowing down. Principle number 11 uh, goes into specifying that overall spending can sometimes get out of line with the economy's productive capacities. It could be due to a recession. It could be due to a contraction. It can be due to inflation pressures when there's a increase in the general price level. It could happen due to market failures when there's a crisis in the economy and we had several market failures uh, in the 90s, in, in, in um, 1999 and 2001, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, most of you were younger. Uh, it could be due to income disparities. Uh, overall spending could get out of line with the economy's productive capacities. And if this overall spending increases or decreases, it can misalign the economies. And it, and it has a significant effect. Um, small businesses rely a lot on local consumptions. And if those small businesses are not generating sales, they're not employing people, then it creates a slowdown. So that's a great example how something small can trigger economic effects at the greater scale. Uh, and recessions tend to last six months. A smarter recession, a severe recession, six months to 12 months, a significant recession, 12 months to 18 months, a depressed economy is 24 months. This COVID crisis, it's, it's out there. It, it, it affected a lot of people. A lot of people are, you know, if it wasn't for government relief, uh, unemployment benefits, and some are getting it, some are not, uh, and people are finding themselves in bad shape. It's a form of market failure. The government cannot agree whether or not to provide payments uh, to families. And so families are in really need of those payments, like significantly uh, uh, in need. Uh, and, and the financial crisis was as close as we got to that in 2008, 2009. And now in this 2021 crisis, uh, we still need some form of uh, relief uh, government spending bill. Uh, it's important to note that for every 10 years, there's some form of crisis. The crisis in 2008 uh, lasted for about 16 months, almost uh, 20, almost 18 months. It started to recover after 18 months. And then for 10 years, the economy prospered. And then in 2019, 20, and now 21, we're going to another crisis. So we have this cycle of recessions, contractions, overall spending improving, the, the, uh, uh, not improving. Um, that happens for various reasons. Sometimes it's government-induced, sometimes it's market-induced, market failure, and in some cases, it improves a lot. And principle number 12 specifies that it is the responsibility of the government to recognize economic contractions, design economic policy to stimulate the economy. And it is the role of government to intervene when needed in a respected, responsible uh, manner. Uh, we have government policies such as fiscal policy that requires government spending in the economy and taxation laws. But this is often used for various reasons, not always necessarily when there's a crisis, but it, it is used all of the time. Government spending uh, happens at the uh, federal level every year, whether we have or don't have a crisis. 
taxation laws uh, can increase or decrease taxes, have tax uh, cuts, have tax freezes. But if you do have a lot of government spending, sooner or later, taxes need to increase. It's important for most people to recognize. The government has a budget, okay? It's a budget to spend. And it has a source of revenue. And that source of revenue is from federal taxations, income tax, uh, government bonds, and so on. And they have this budget that they acquire that they need to spend money on, but they need to have some revenue streams. And if not enough revenue is coming in, and there's a lot of government spending taking taking place, they need to borrow from somewhere else, uh, issue government treasuries, government bonds, or tax the public. It's like when you have, for example, your bank account. Uh, if you're working, money's coming in, and then you're spending. But let's say right now, if you're not working and you need to spend, well, cash flow is not coming in, and you're spending, someone needs to be financing your spending. Credit card companies, mom and dad, grandma, friends, need to start borrowing to continue the spending, and the government rarely stops spending. Uh, and one of the sources of revenue for government is some form of taxation. So that's going to be a debate coming up in the next few years. Keep an eye for higher tax laws or a proposal to increase taxes because there's a lot of government spending taking place. Um, so government is always active. There's government shutdowns to, res to attempt to resolve it. They can always increase uh, the, debt, the, the debt ceiling ratio and so on. Uh, monetary policy. It's a secondary policy that they can use, complementary to fiscal policy by, done by the Federal Reserve of the United States. It can change the money supply. It can uh, increase money supply. It can decrease money supply. It can influence the financial markets directly through the financial institutions, uh, like banks in the country. It can lower interest rates. And it's important to note that the monetary policy is conducted by the United States Federal Reserve. Uh, which controls the money supply in the U.S. economy. Those are two different different uh, institutions uh, that can stimulate the economy if needed. Uh, it works, uh, you know. In, in the in some scenarios, the United States Fed can just issue more currency to, you know, satisfy government spending. But that's not always good because it could trigger some form of inflation, higher prices, and unstable currency. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, okay, great. Uh, we're going to conclude with chap uh, with principle number 12 and today's chapter discussion. Uh, your assignment opens this week right after a lecture, and it's due by the end of the week. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.